Hi everyone and welcome to video number 21 on warfare. Now warfare, we're in the modern era ladies and gentlemen, we're looking at the nature of warfare and this time we're looking at weapons. Now we're looking at the 20th century but because there's been so much change and progress I'm going to divide it into two. This first video we'll look at the developments in weapons from 1900 to 1945, the end of the Second World War. So let's have a look at some of the changes that have taken place in this just under half a century. Now weapons, let's have a start with the machine gun. World War I there were machine guns, the Vickers machine gun was an example. But although they were effective and they caused huge carnage at battles like the Battle of the Somme, wait, there'll be a video on the Battle of the Somme later. But the early World War I machine guns, they were very, very heavy, often not very mobile. It needed more than one soldier to actually work a machine gun. They were effective, sometimes firing 600 bullets per minute as we'll see at the carnage at the Somme. But there was room for change. So as we move to World War II, the technology meant that the machine gun had changed, the machine gun had improved. And we get examples like the Bren machine gun or the Thompson machine gun. They were lighter, allowed more mobility because they could be worked and carried by just the one soldier. So machine guns are one example of change in the early 20th century with weapons. Another example are the tanks. Now, again, Battle of the Somme, key battle in World War I, tanks were used, only about 50 of them, over quite a large area, and they were very, very slow moving, maybe two, three, four miles an hour. Even I'm quicker than that. They often broke down, so their impact was somewhat limited. But they did cause fear amongst the enemy soldiers, and they showed that maybe this was a way forward, this was a change or development which might be worth dealing with and improving. And even in the last two years of World War I, the use of tanks did change. For example, the Battle of Cambrai in 1917. 400 tanks were used this time, so they're using more tanks and they are concentrating them in a smaller area. They were slightly getting more quicker and because they were more concentrated, they could punch through and they were able to make a breakthrough, the Battle of Cambrai. And they advanced eight kilometers, five miles in old money. In World War I term, terms, that was a huge breakthrough. They're trying to break the stalemate. When we move to World War II, the tanks, for example, the Churchill tank, they were stronger, they were more reliable, they were quicker by now, 20, 30 miles an hour, more mobile, they could give support for the infantry. Here was a change. Go back into history. The support for the infantry came from what? Bonus points if you said cavalry. Well, if you like, the tanks were the modern mechanized cavalry because they were providing the support for the infantry. And at the start of World War II, it was the Germans who used tanks effectively as part of their tactic of Blitzkrieg, all based on speed and mobility. So, tanks were another change. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for one of my silly outfits, I apologise. Oh, oh, look at this. Oh, now then, what am I doing here, ladies and gentlemen? Well, I hope you can see quite clearly that I'm going up in the air. A pilot. Up, down, flying around, looping the loop and defying the ground. Aircraft, ladies and gentlemen. Now, oh, I can barely see. 1914, World War I. Put my glasses up there, that's better. There's no such thing as the Royal Air Force. 
the Royal Flying Corps is what they were called. Great book there about the Air Force, British Air Force in World War One. The Royal Flying Corps. 1914, the start of the war, they had 63 planes. Their impact was limited. They would have to fire from the plane. By 1916, improvements in technology, things begin to get better. The machine gun could be timed so that as the propeller is going round, the bullet would go through whilst the propeller wasn't going to be hit. A big technological breakthrough. Also, as World War I went on, the planes were used to bomb the troops, map positions, take photographs, improve surveillance, communication, intelligence gathering. By the end of the war, 1918, the Royal Flying Corps had 22,000 planes. We can see a change there, ladies and gentlemen. So aircraft in World War I begins to change that particular weapon. Reminds me of that old joke. What did the hat, what did the hat say to the scarf? Any ideas? What did the hat say to the scarf? He said, you hang around while I go on ahead. Way! <laughs> oh, I apologize. I apologize for that. Terrible behavior. So, World War One, the aircraft begin to in begin to change. So I've used change quite a lot so far in this video. I've mainly concentrated on World War One. Right at the very end of World War One, there was a very important battle which helped to end the war, the Battle of Amiens, A M I E N S, Amiens. Now, 1918. In that battle, the British Army had 450 tanks. Change. They had 1,900 planes. Change. It allowed quite a big breakthrough. They're trying to break the stalemate. And even when we move to World War II, again, the Royal Flying Corps had changed and become the Royal Air Force. And in World War II, the tactics involving aircraft change. We get two types of aircraft. One, the fighters, like the Spitfire, the Hurricane, very, very fast, 350 mile an hour, very, very maneuverable. And we get the bombers, like the Lancaster bomber, the Blenheim bomber. And the bombers would go and bomb, and the fighters would fly with them for protection in case they were attacked. So aircraft begins to change in World War II. I mentioned earlier in this video, the Germans used Blitzkrieg, lightning war was the translation. And that meant that they would attack very, very quickly and they would use their planes to bomb and often destroy enemy air force, enemy aircraft whilst they were on the ground. I've already mentioned they used tanks. They would drop parachutists paratroopers from the aircraft behind the enemy lines. It was all about speed and mobility and weight of attack. Blitzkrieg, very effective using the changes in these weapons. Now, what other changes were there to do with the aircraft? Well, the fighters, as World War II went on, developments occurred, technology got better, they were fitted with extra petrol tanks, which increased their range. Fighters could now fly 3,000 kilometers, huge journeys. 1944, the British introduced their jet fighter, the Meteor, twice as fast as the previous fighters, up to 600 miles an hour, giving better protection for the bombers. Other technological developments to do with aircraft. Improved guidance so that the bombs were more accurate. They were radio directed using something called the oboe system. The strategy changed how to use aircraft altered in World War II. Sometimes bombs were aimed now at military sites, factories, also cities to damage civilian morale. 
Those of you who've looked at my videos on the Blitz in London will know all about the idea of targeting civilians. So we had the Blitz in London, but the British, the Royal Air Force here, also went and bombed the German cities. Berlin was attacked, as were, as were cities like Hamburg and Dresden. Huge casualties trying to impact and destroy civilian morale. So aircraft is another area where the weapons begin to change. Right, time to... Oh, oh my goodness me. Time to get out of my pilot gear and move to one of possibly the most important changes and developments in the 20th century to do with weapons. Have you any idea what that might be? Ladies and gentlemen, I lay before you the atom bomb. The Manhattan Project, led by a team of scientists led by a man called Dr. Robert Oppenheimer, based in Los Alamos in New Mexico in the USA. There was a fear amongst the Allies that the Nazis were trying to develop their own atom bomb and they wanted to develop theirs first. It was tested and it was ready by the end of World War II. 1945, the Americans thought that they had an atom bomb which would work. And Dr. Robert Oppenheimer, after it was used, he, he came up with a very famous phrase. He said, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Well, that's quite a powerful statement. But based on what happened towards the end of World War II, you can see what he meant. Because on the 6th of August, 1945, an American bomber took off and dropped the atom bomb, which was nicknamed Little Boy, on the city of Hiroshima. And the plane was called the Enola Gay. 1980, a band called OMD had a song. Enola Gay, you should have stayed at home yesterday. Maybe they should have, because dropping the atom bomb on Hiroshima destroyed the city and caused immediately thousands and thousands of deaths, maybe 80, 90,000 straight away, and many more over the following weeks and months and years as radiation took effect. Three days later, on the 9th of August, 1945, another bomb was dropped, this time called Fat Man, on the Japanese city of Nagasaki. Again, thousands of casualties, thousands of fatalities. The world had changed. The atom bomb. I'll do more on that in a later video. Now, we move to another type of weapon, chemical warfare. Now, if you know anything about the fighting in the trenches, Chemicals were used by both sides, mustard gas, chlorine gas, phosgene gas. There were about maybe between 100 and 150 attacks by both sides on men in the trenches. Now, at first, people did not have gas masks. They were introduced as a result of these attacks. But what could they do? Well, somebody had the bright idea of having a handkerchief and basically doing a wee, putting urine on a handkerchief and putting it over your nose and mouth in case you were attacked. Okay, ah, not very pleasant, but it might keep you alive. So you could say, really, it wasn't a really bad idea. Apologize for that. But chemical warfare was a terrible, terrible use of weapons. And after World War II, 1925, the Geneva Protocol banned chemical weapons and they were not used in World War II. So again, there was a weapon there which was banned. So we see quite a few examples there of how weapons changed from 1900 to 1945, the first part of the 20th century. 
Now, I've talked about change. In a way, change happened in a certain pattern. Because, first of all, improvements, developments, progress was made in attack weapons. Okay? Then, because the attack weapons had the advantage, progress, developments, technology was used in the defense weapons, which would then create a stalemate. And then, to break the stalemate, people would then advance and develop and improve attack weapons. So we get this constant pattern, attack, defense, attack. For example, in World War I, right at the start, railways, it was a war of movement. The German advanced quite a long way into France. Attack was in charge. But then, defense took over. The artillery, the machine gun, the tactics, the trenches caused stalemate defense for about two, three years. But then, as I've tried to suggest in this video, attack weapons began to improve again. The tanks, the aircraft, and in the end, Battle of Amiens, Battle of Cambrai, the stalemate was broken. And you can do that exactly the same for World War II. The pattern of change. Now, sometimes in the exam, they ask you, ladies and gentlemen, about factors. Factors. In other words, why things changed. Now, one big change that we've looked at so far, from medieval up to what we've looked at in this video. Medieval warfare, 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, even into the 1800s. Warfare was limited. What do I mean by that? Well, often commanders would try to avoid battles, preferring instead sieges and things like that. Relatively speaking, the armies were fairly small. The impact on the civilian population was quite limited. Yes, it could be bad in one area, but it wouldn't be countrywide necessarily. So impact on civilians sometimes was more limited. So often, again, finally on this limited warfare, sometimes warfare would not continue all year round. It was limited to the time of year where the weather was better to allow the armies to move, often spring, autumn, summer. There was rarely fighting in the winter. But as we move into the 1900s, into the 20th century, as I tried to show you in this video, things did change. What factors were involved in that? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to give you something that hopefully might allow you to remember it. I'm going to give you fast dogs. Fast dogs, what's he on about? Well, I'm on about whippets. Slightly smaller than a greyhound, but a very fast dog. Whippets. If you can remember that, ladies and gentlemen, it might help you if they ask in an exam what factors led to changes in weapons in the 20th century. So what do I mean when I'm on about whippets? There we have it, ladies and gentlemen. W, weapons, H, they've had to join, conscription. I, industry. P, population. P, political power. E, economic power. T, technology. S, science. Whippets. They are the factors involved in changing the nature of warfare in the early part of the 20th century. Well, let's have a few examples, shall we? Weapons, W, W for weapons. Machine guns, tanks, aircraft, bombs, all changed in the 20th century. H, had to join, conscription, this meant that the armies were huge. Millions of people were in the army. World War I from 1916, you had to join the army. World War II, you had to join conscription, army, navy, air force, whichever one. Once you got to a certain age, you had to join or you were put in prison if you objected. 
I, industry. Factories producing weapons on a huge scale. Just one example of that. 1914, start of World War I. Britain, one million shells. End of World War I, Britain, 23 million shells. Well, they all had to be produced and manufactured. Industry, factories, geared up for warfare. A big change. P, population. I mentioned in the earlier warfare, often the civilian population did not get involved. Well, it did in World War II. Because of the Blitz and all the, tr the way that warfare had come to British cities, World War II, there were 1.4 million people who volunteered to be air raid wardens. That shows the level of involvement in the population. A change. The second P, political power. The government is getting involved and controlling everything. In World War I, they passed DORA, Defense of the Realm Act. They're in charge of everything. World War II, they're in charge of rationing, controlling the food that people eat. The government is taking political power. E, economic power. Warfare in the 20th century required a huge budget, huge amount spent, billions and billions. Now, although Britain was quite a rich country, it did not have that money. What could it do? Well, it does what we all do. If we need money, we borrow money. And to give you an idea, Britain finally paid back what it owed America from World War II. World War II, remember, which finished in 1945, and we repaid our debt 2006. You were probably still alive, just you were alive when Britain finally repaid its World War II debt to America. Just think how much we borrowed because war had changed. So money, economics is vital in warfare in the 20th century as was the T, technology. I mentioned in the video the way that World War I aircraft got more effective when the technology could fire machine gun bullets through the, the, the propeller without hitting the propeller, which would bring the plane down. Technology sorted that out. I mentioned also the British jet, the Meteor, which could fly twice as fast as normal British fighters enabling it to bring better support to the bombers. Technology is having a huge impact. And the final one of Whippets, S for science. Scientific discoveries helped change warfare. A couple of examples for you. In the Battle of Britain, apart from the very, very good work done by pilots, in Spitfires, pilots from Britain and other countries, for example, Poland and the, the British Empire, as it was called then, the Commonwealth. So apart from the great work done by the pilots and the technicians on the ground, radar helped Britain in the Battle of Britain. Radar. I've already mentioned the atom bomb. Well, that was developed by a team of scientists. And it was based on the work of Albert Einstein, one of the greatest scientists of the 20th century. Another area, a man called Alan Turing, working at a place called Bletchley Park, using maths and science to decode the German secret messages on the Enigma, the decoding machine. Many people believe that he shortened the war and the work of Bletchley Park and Enigma shortened the war by two years and saved millions of lives. Science getting involved and helping in the changes and developments of war in the first part of the 20th century. So there we have it, ladies and gentlemen. As ever, I hope it's been useful. Now, this is the first half of the 20th century. What happens in the second half of the 20th century and into the 21st century? That, of course, will come on the next video. I'll speak to you soon. All the best now. Take care.